Good evening, good people. This is Health and Wellness. My name is Zaitun Ali, and today we're coming to you from the Parklands Kidney Center, and the topic of discussion is about kidney transplant. So right here on set, I have Dr. Twahil, Ahmed Twahil, uh, who is from this Parklands Kidney Center, and also have Felicitas Chure. Have I said it right? Yes. Churie. Yes. Okay, yes. Welcome so much, Felicitas. She is one of the patients of um, Dr. Twahir, whose son was done for a kidney transplant um, years back. When was it? 1990. 1990. So they'll get to explain more about this um, condition and how the treatment process is right here on Health and Wellness. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank Saito. you very much. And I know I was talking about kidney transplant. Most of the people now want to know perhaps what is the function of this organ in our body. Okay, thank you very much, uh, viewers. The functions of the kidneys are to filter uh, excess water from the body and to remove toxins from the body. The other functions which are not well appreciated by many people the kidneys are involved with control of blood pressure and the kidneys are also involved with production of red blood cells to improve your hemoglobin and also the kidneys are involved in maintaining the bone strength in your body. So when the kidney fails, a lot of these functions actually get uh, damaged and uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to replace these functions. Yeah, and even before we get to Felicita, um, perhaps explain what, at what point do we get until now the kidney fails? The most common conditions that uh, are associated with kidney failure are diabetes, mm -hmm. high blood pressures, and infections that cause what we call glomerulonephritis mm -hmm. that damages the kidney. And this happens over many years. And when the kidney reaches uh, about 50% kidney function, we call this stage five kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you reach this stage, you're not very far from uh, advanced kidney failure that will require dialysis or transplantation. Okay, so before we come to the dialysis and transplantations, perhaps um, Felicitas, you can tell us about your experience. What happened to a point where your son got the yeah, transplant? I'm, I'm Felicita Churi. I donated my kidney to my son, Tobiko, in, my, in June, on June 13, 1990. He had been sick for seven years. It started off first with one kidney, which seemed to have been eaten by moth. The x-rays showed it was all dark. And uh, the doctor advised me and said, yes, one kidney is okay, but usually, like our eyes, when one eye is touched, the other one tears, and eventually both of them start tearing. So chances are, even the second kidney may eventually be affected. It was a big shock to me, and I asked the doctor what could have happened, because at that time, Tobiko, my son, was 16 years old. And the doctor said he must have had a sore throat, which was either treated or untreated, but the toxins went down and uh, attacked the kidneys. So we were in and out of hospital, of course, with blood pressure. He couldn't go upstairs. He was getting too tired. He was swelling his hands, his feet, his face. He was losing so much protein mm -hmm. in his urine, and the more protein he lost, the more the body absorbed fluids. So he retained a lot of fluids, both in his lungs and his feet. So it was very difficult. But we used to come to Aga Khan all the time, until one time the doctor told me, you know what, at this rate, we have six months, then we have to do a transplant. And my son said, I am paranoid about dialysis. Can we see what we can do so that at least if the transplant has to be done, let it be done before I go through a dialysis. And that's what we did. I went through all the tests at Aga Khan, some were done in Nairobi Hospital, some at Kemri, 
And I remember some of them were taken out of the country. And when we were all set, and even he, he was going through a lot of tests. And the tests I went through were, am I healthy enough? And are we compatible? And if I was going to be a donor, are they going to trigger any problems in me? And all that was established. I was healthy. Um, I was 45 years then. I was healthy. Everything was okay. And of course, as I, as I said, doctors don't take chances. Yeah. So they really established. So before somebody becomes a donor, one good thing one should celebrate is that it is established you are healthy. Okay. So when everything was ready, then of course, and you was ready and you were compatible. And uh, so the, uh, then there was the preparation for the transplant. And before we get to the preparation now of the transplant, right. so perhaps let me throw this question back to Dr. Tari. Um, did you handle um, the case of Tobiko? I happened to meet Tobiko after his transplant. Ah, okay. But I'd just like to describe what uh, Mrs. Churi explained about her son who, from her description, her son probably had uh, what I was explaining called glomerulonephritis, which involves uh, getting an infection, usually a sore throat, and you get antibodies that try to uh, fight the infection and goes and damages the kidney as a complication. So this is called glomerulonephritis. Over the years, the kidney is weakened and the symptoms are leg swelling, uh, getting tired, difficulty in breathing, okay. until to an extent that the body cannot handle it anymore. And this is the time many people present to the doctor when it's too late. So maybe at this point, uh, like to advise the viewers uh, yes. that uh, one of the things you can do to detect kidney disease at a very early stage is to go to your doctor for a medical checkup. Mm -hmm. The doctor will look at your urine for protein, will measure your blood pressure and look and see whether you have diabetes, measure your blood test to see what is the percentage of your kidney function. And at this very early stage, uh, there's actually um, new medications that are there even in Kenya that have been shown to reduce the progression of kidney disease. So if you were to develop kidney failure in uh, five or 10 years, these medications have been shown that they can actually delay uh, your kidney uh, failure to even 20 to 30 years. So it's very important to have yourself go for a simple medical checkup mm -hmm. to determine whether you have kidney disease because as you know, kidney disease is a silent disease. Mm -hmm. okay. By the time you start having symptoms, it's quite advanced and it's usually too late. And the only thing left now is dialysis or a transplant as happened to uh, Mrs. Churi's son, Tobiko. Okay, actually even Felicita has mentioned some of the symptoms that uh, mm -hmm. the, the patients actually show when they get this condition. Yeah. But again, you've mentioned about one type of the kidney failure. Are there other types? Okay, this uh, kidney failure is divided into chronic kidney disease mm -hmm. and acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury is usually reversible. You can get acute kidney injury from infections like malaria, typhoid. If you get dehydrated, you can get acute kidney injury. And usually this is reversible if you catch it early, but it's important also to monitor after acute kidney injury because some people progress to chronic kidney disease and eventually will require some form of treatment. Okay. Then there's a chronic kidney disease, which is usually caused by uh, diseases like I've mentioned, uh, like hypertension, diabetes, and the chronic, the glomerulonephritis, which is a consequence of infections. And there are also other inherited diseases uh, like polycystic kidney diseases, which are quite rare. There's also autoimmune diseases like lupus, mm -hmm. uh, which can also damage the kidneys. You know, so these are the other causes of kidney disease. And uh, as I said, there's acute and there's chronic. Acute is reversible, chronic is progressive. Okay. And now, now let's say now the um, kidney, you've detected that there's kidney failure. Now we come to the treatment processes. So there are two that majorly we know about, dialysis and now the transplant. So do we now start, is there, is there a format as to where we start the treatment? Do we start with the dialysis first and then now 
reaches a point where we go to the transplant or one can just do the transplant as soon as they know that their kidneys have failed. Okay, if one comes early enough, eh? mm -hmm. like what happened to Mrs. Churis San Tobico, yes. you are able to monitor the progress of the disease mm -hmm. and you can tell that in a few months, mm -hmm. this patient will require dialysis. So before the required dialysis, you can now start the transplantation process eh? and uh, you actually uh, are able to avoid dialysis. Unfortunately, many patients come when it's too late. Okay. So they land to the clinic, they're already having difficulty in breathing, they have a lot of leg swellings, and at this stage, mm. you have no choice but to start dialysis as you're preparing for a transplant, because the ideal is transplant. Most people will uh, feel much better with a transplant than to continue with dialysis. Dialysis should just be a stopgap for most mm. people, unless obviously you're quite old, uh, or you are uh, you, you are not able to function, and uh, you are not able to uh, tolerate transplant because not everybody can tolerate transplant. Okay. If you have advanced heart failure, for example, you'll not be able to undergo a transplant, and you might just have to continue with your dialysis. Okay. Kidney disease has actually been labeled as perhaps a disease for the elderly, but for this case, Tobiko got it at 16 years of age. Could you kindly explain this? Are there more um, cases of uh, children perhaps getting it at the age of Tobiko at 16 years? So, uh, kidney disease can affect any age group. Eh? Okay. In the West, eh, it affects more of the elderly mm -hmm. because a lot of the uh, uh, Western uh, population is mm -hmm. elderly with uh, diabetes and hypertension. Eh? But in Africa, where most of our population is younger, we, many of our patients are getting infections being the cause of their kidney disease mm -hmm. and other inherited disorders which catch you at a young age. And uh, that's why we see a lot of our African population having kidney disease at a younger age yes. and uh, the West have kidney disease at an older age. Okay, okay, that is well noted. But uh, for dialysis, how was the experience? You, you guys didn't go through a dialysis, no, you we went did. through yeah, the we transplant. Did. No, no. And uh, perhaps I should have mentioned yeah. before it was discovered that Tobiko had a kidney problem, we had gone to a hospital for two years mm -hmm. with him complaining about backache. He had constant backaches. And we thought since he was a sportsman and we thought since he used to carry heavy books with a backpack, that could be the reason. Mm -hmm. Until eventually I noticed that his feet were swelling. And that's when, when the late father took him to the doctor and the father said, oh, you better check. The mom is saying his feet are swollen. Okay. And uh, of course, the people kept on saying, no, I played football. Your eyes are swollen. No, I overslept. So that's when the doctor said, hey, let's do the kidney function tests. And that's when everything came up. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't go through the dialysis. And uh, I don't know, I'm not a specialist in this, but Dr. Tawahir can confirm. I think a transplant before dialysis, uh, if possible, it's not always possible, I think is a better option. I, I don't know, it could be, I believe the dialysis also drains them. Mm -hmm. that that's, was... the, that's the feeling I have. Because I had read so much about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very afraid of dialysis. But we were lucky. We managed to, well, the doctors put the teams together. It was a big team. And it was done here at Agakan. And it was success on the spot. Perhaps explain to us you, um, how the process was like in terms of the transplant. Oh my goodness, it was very, very involving. Okay. There were very many tests going on on him and very many on me. And uh, I did a lot of tests here to show I was healthy. And he, they had to keep him well so as to be able to wake up from the medicine they give them during transplant. Is it anesthesia or...? Yeah, general anesthesia. Yeah, because you have to be strong mm -hmm. to wake up from that. Then both of us were sent to Camry to see how compatible we are with. Mm -hmm. 
and I think I saw as if there were four major tests and uh, they were 92 percent I didn't understand but we were very compatible okay and even after that he still went through very many tests I still had to keep on going through the tests and they kept on updating updating and once all the tests were done the whole team of surgeons physicians the theater renal nurses and the anesthetists mm -hmm. we met in one of the big theaters in the hospital just to go through the rehearsal we had to see uh, what what should we be going on and what we should expect and we were free to ask all the questions and uh, one thing i always remember yeah. the main surgeon of the team the late dr Tagiri Ndirangu, he said, you are healthy, we have prepared everything, everything will be fine, but there are chances of 50-50 rejection. Okay. But we are prepared for that. So we felt very encouraged, we felt the doctors were with us, we felt so much confidence in the hospital, and uh, we just could not wait for it to be done. Okay. Yeah. Doc, perhaps you can let us know, how can I now get a donor in case I, I am about to get this kidney transplant? One of the biggest challenges of uh, kidney failure is getting a donor to do the transplant. And that's why we still have a lot of patients on dialysis. Okay. Now, getting a donor is not easy because you need to get a donor that matches you. You heard what uh, Mrs. Churi said, they had to go through very rigorous testing to identify that, that her kidney would match her son's kidney, uh, would match her son's uh, body so that the body doesn't reject that kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, the process is not as complex at, as it used to be. At that time, it was one of the first transplants that her son was, was being done in Kenya. Okay. Since then, we've done many, many transplants and they've been very successful. And so it's more easier to do. However, the process that uh, the donor has to go through is still very rigorous. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to make sure that the donor is very healthy. In fact, normally when I identify a donor who can donate, I tell them you're fit enough to go to the moon now. Okay. Yeah, nice. because that's <laughs> yeah. how a donor should be. That very, more healthy than even uh, <laughs> an, an individual who's not going to donate. Mm -hmm. You see. So then they have to go through the process of matching, and it's not only the tissue typing that most people are familiar with and the blood group. We also have to make sure that the white cell uh, matches, and we also have to make sure that the recipient does not have antibodies that will attack the new kidney. And if there is any chance of attack, then uh, the transplant will not occur. If we find uh, even the slightest risk of the donor developing complications, yes. then we cancel the transplant. And uh, who sh can be a donor? In Kenya right now, we only allow what is called living related donation. Okay. If you are unrelated, uh, we do not encourage such transplants because of the fear of uh, organ trafficking and uh, uh, illegal transplants because uh, uh, we, dis we, 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 we are aware that this is a problem that is happening and even in Kenya we've uh, identified a few uh, one center that was involved and oh, really? is under investigation right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, we have to be extremely careful in making sure that the donor oh. is related to the, uh, uh, to the recipient. Currently, Kenya has progressed quite far because uh, they, are, they are setting up a uh, transplant authority mm -hmm. that will oversee transplants in this country. Great. So once that authority is set up, I'm confident that non-related donation will be allowed, friendly donation will be allowed, because now we have a process to ensure that uh, transplantation is being done 
uh, above uh, or, or above board and there's no illegal transplants going on yeah. but up to now we only allow living related transplantation okay. and something exciting that's also happening in Kenya is the law has now been passed that we can do deceased donation that means ah. when somebody dies in theater or in, in an ICU let's say or in an accident you're actually allowed to retrieve those organs and transplant them into somebody who needs an organ okay. so that's very exciting and we're looking forward to that in the near future okay thank you doc so we want to take a short commercial break and when we come back we'll know more from felicita how life was after the transplant and doctor will also show us some modern technologies that are used to do these treatment processes so stay tuned this is health and wellness Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Health and Wellness, and we've been discussing about kidney transplant. And right here, we are at Parklands Kidney Center, and I'm joined by Dr. Twahir and Felicita. Felicita was a donor to her own son when the transplant was being done in 1990, right? Yes. And uh, she's given us her experience, and right now she's also going to tell us live how it was after the transplant as we continue more on the show. And before we get to you, there's someone here on the SMS line with a question directed to you, Dr. Twahir, and they're asking, if I start my dialysis, does this mean that I have to go through it the rest of my life? Okay, that's a very good question. As I said earlier, yeah. there's two types of uh, kidney failure. There's the acute kidney injury where the kidney is in a state of shock mm -hmm. and it usually recovers with time. And usually this is caused by infections like malaria, typhoid, or uh, dehydration secondary to diarrhea and uh, you might require dialysis for a short period of time okay. and then your kidneys usually do recover but again uh, you'll still need follow-up to make sure that your kidneys remain well for the rest of your life then there's the chronic kidney disease where you reach an advanced stage and your kidneys have totally failed then you'll require to be put on uh, dialysis for the rest of your life or to undergo a transplant at one time or another. Okay. Now, the dialysis does not uh, cure kidney failure. It just removes the toxins from your body and the excess water that is in your body. And it'll, you'll need this support until the time that you get a new kidney. Okay, that is well put. Thank you for that, Dr. And Felicita, just as we were talking about this, tell us how was life after the transplant? Yes. Um... We had really been prepared uh, on what to do after the transplant. I was in the hospital for nine days. My son was there for 12 days. And when we went home, for three months, nobody came home because his immunity had completely been suppressed. So, um, and he was on a lot of immunosuppressants, blood pressure, cholesterol, name it. So three months, of course, we used to come to the hospital. Today, we would see the physician. He would give us the lab, uh, lab forms for tests. The following day, we see the surgeon who was checking whether the blood flow in the kidney was okay. The third day, we went back to the physician. So the first three months were very, very intense. And uh, we really had to watch the, uh, the, the diet. And uh, as time went by, uh, the visits to the hospital reduced. But the amount of medication, and at that time, all the medicines that he was using were patented. So, uh, it was very, very involving, and uh, we had to make sure all the medicines were at a particular pharmacy 
or at the hospital because we didn't have other kidney patients, kidney transplant patients, so the medicines had to be ordered. So it was really difficult and no insurance would touch him because it was chronic. But uh, we went on and on and he was getting better and better. But with the time, I noticed that it also affected his mental well-being. He became a bit depressed and uh, I, I didn't understand because I, like everybody else, expected now you have a new kidney, you are doing so well, why are you not up and about? Yeah. Did he go back to like the normal no. activities? Well, he did to some extent. For him, after the transplant, he felt very well, he could eat anything and uh, he felt much stronger and I think he became quite confident. In spite of that, later on I said he went into a bit of depression which was sorted out. He worked for two years. I was always on top form, I was fine and the doctors monitored him until it came to a point where we used to see Dr. Twahir after every six months. He was doing very well. And after his death, I wrote two books because I felt Kenyans need to understand. I call this book, I Once Had a Son, second edition. This is all about his illness, the transplant after, and the life after. Then I wrote another one, Tobiko and the Maasai Room, which is about him before he got sick. So I wrote these books because I felt people fear they really fear the kidney illness, they fear donating, but to me, nobody should fear it. All we need is to understand. Okay. And Dr. Ray, at this point, maybe you can just talk about the events that occurred before Tobiko's demise. What led to this demise? Uh, sometimes when you undergo a kidney transplant, uh, some of the complications that uh, one might get is uh, infections, because uh, your immunity is down, the drugs that you're given are supposed to prevent rejection. Now, the antibodies that normally fight diseases are the same ones that cause rejection. So when you give somebody medications to reduce their immunity so it doesn't at uh, attack the new kidney, they're at risk of developing infections. So this is a common complicate, not common, but it can occur. And this is probably one of the reasons that Tobiko developed an infection, which unfortunately was not able to be treated because uh, not all infections will respond to antibiotics. And he rapidly went down and passed away. Okay, I'm so sorry about your loss, yeah. but uh, it is well. And perhaps for others who reject it, the kidney, what happens at this point? So again, a, a kidney rejection is another complication that can occur after a transplant. Now, remember, you've been given a kidney of somebody else. So your body will look at it as a foreign uh, organ and try to reject it. Sometimes the medicine you're given are not enough to prevent the rejection and you go and reject the kidney. And unfortunately, you might have to go back on dialysis after that. The other reason is, or for rejection is a few people are not able to afford medications after the transplant and uh, they skip their medications and their body, uh, the bodies attack this new kidney and reject it. Now, dialysis is more costly than a transplant. Okay. It would make more sense for somebody to undergo a transplant because at the end of the day, they will save money as the cost of the medications uh, cheaper than the cost of dialysis. Mm. So for the insurance payers, I would encourage them to support transplantation rather than dialysis, which eventually is more costly. Okay, that is well noted and uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience and uh, like i said before we are going to see some of the modern advancements and technologies used for this dialysis process and uh, we're just coming you, you'll see a few of this as we come back and wind up the show
Joining me right here is Dr. Zoya Adam. She is a nephrologist right here at the Parklands Kidney Center, and she's going to take us through the dialysis process and how it works. Karibu sana. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so what do we have right here? So what you have here is a dialysis machine. Um, patients that are in this unit usually have what we call end-stage renal disease, okay. which means without the aid of a dialysis machine, uh, their lifespan would be shortened. So basically, this is a dialysis machine, and our patients have two kinds of accesses here. They either have what we call a fistula or a tunnel dialysis catheter for dialysis. Okay. So most of them here have fistulas, all right? So what, what does it entail? So a fistula, fistula is okay. a connection that's created between an artery and a vein, okay. and this helps to enlarge the vein, and then the vein becomes the source from which we pull blood into this machine. So if you look at this machine, there's a filter here, and this filter essentially acts like an artificial kidney. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, using these tubings, we connect the machine to the patient, mm -hmm. and then blood is drawn out from the patient into the machine. Okay. Then the blood circulates through this filter, which is an artificial kidney as such, yeah. and toxins that were in the blood get removed through this filter. So what ha happens next is the blood then flows back into the patient, but purified. So all the toxins have been removed through this filter, and then the blood is returned to the patient purified. Okay. So that's essentially how dialysis works and how this machine acts as an artificial kidney. And how do we now interpret this here? So usually this is handled by our nursing staff, but what happens here is you put in the speed at which you want blood to be removed from the patient and processed by the machine. Mm -hmm. We also tend to weigh patients before dialysis to determine how much fluid has accumulated in their body. Okay. And then based on that, we're able to input a figure here in terms of what amount of fluid we want to take off the patient. Mm -hmm. So we'll input the blood flow, we'll input how much fluid we want to remove from the patient, okay? okay? And uh, we will then put in what we call the dialysate flow rate, which in technical terms or yeah. in easy terms <laughs> is just how fast the dialysate flows through the machine. So all these are technical aspects of the machine that are usually handled by our nursing staff. Mm -hmm. And the machine is fairly straightforward and self-explanatory. Um, it doesn't, it's not as confusing as it appears to it, be. it is, it looks like it's very confusing, but again, this as well, is, is it for the same purpose? So we have, this has, has liquid, like water. So mo most of these machines are different brands and different wow. versions, the same. but the concept for all the machines yeah. is essentially the same. Okay. Some of the machines do what we call hemodialysis, which is a conventional dialysis method. Mm -hmm. And then other machines do what we call hemodiafiltration, which is a slightly different from the conventional dialysis, mm -hmm. whereby we're pulling a lot more fluid off the patient. Okay. Yeah. And how how frequent are they oh. supposed to come for this dialysis? So for patients with end-stage renal disease, the optimum amount of dialysis should be three times a week. Okay. Oh. But a lot of the patients here come on for two sessions a week, minimum two sessions a week. Okay. Though the ideal is three times a week. Three times a yes. week. Okay, so this at least it uh, ensures the lifespan. Exactly. So if they were off dialysis, yeah. then they would develop numerous other complications. Okay. And ultimately their lifespan would be shortened. So this machine acts as an artificial kidney to support their kidney function. And at what point do we now get from this dialysis to now the transplant? So a lot of these patients are on dialysis yeah. for a prolonged period of time up until the transplant process is complete, they have a suitable donor, they've gone through all the evaluation and they're ready for transplant. Okay. So up until then they would require dialysis and often people refer to it as a bridge to transplant. Okay. Thank you so much for this information. We've got it right. That was Dr. Zoya right here at the Parklands Kidney Center. Thank you so Thank much. You for having me. Welcome to Parkland Kidney Center. My name is Susan. I work at Parkland Kidney Center as a nurse. I want to take you through the water plant for dialysis. A water plant machine uh, is able to take about 50 machines 
and it is very important to have a water plant because a water plant is the heart of dialysis. Without clean water, you will not be able to do good dialysis and your patients will never be stable. So water has to be utterly purified and especially when you are doing hemodialysis, you can't do anything other than having clean water. So the process, the water comes from the state council, it goes through the sand filters, from the sand filters it goes to the carbon filters, and from the carbon filters it goes to the softener and then to the RO. So the water from RO is ready to do dialysis. The major causes of kidney disease are diabetes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, usually caused by infections, lupus, inherited diseases like polycystic kidney disease. The kidney is an organ that weighs about 150 grams. You have two kidneys, usually in each individual, which are at the back of your body, just below the ribs. The function of the kidneys are to filter excess water from your body, remove toxins from your body, control the red blood cell count in your body, which eventually leads to your hemoglobin levels. The other function of the kidneys are to strengthen your bones and to control blood pressure. When your kidney fails, you will need to undergo dialysis and preferably a kidney transplant. So the kidney receives blood from the heart through the renal artery, which is in red. Each kidney has got one million filters. So most individuals are born with two million filters. So the blood enters the nephron, which is the filter, and the nephron filters the blood and creates urine, which is in the space there, which we call the calyx. And the urine passes down to the ureter into the bladder. The blood then returns to the heart through the vein and it's pumped back to the rest of the body through the left side of the heart. And it ends up back in the kidney through the same process again. There are several diseases that can affect the kidney and these are diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, and infections. Sometimes kidneys can be affected by cysts in the kidney, which is called polycystic kidney disease. And these cysts tend to damage the tissue of the kidneys and destroy the kidneys and the kidneys stop working. This is an inherited disease uh, that can affect uh, uh, members of the family. So one member of the family is detected with such a disease, the other members need to have themselves investigated for this. What I'd like to inform the viewers is that Kidney disease can be managed if detected early. Unfortunately, many patients go to the doctor when it's quite advanced. This is because kidney disease is a silent disease. So what is recommended is that individuals should seek medical review on a regular basis to determine whether they have a kidney disease or not. And this involves a very simple checkup of your blood pressure, blood sugar, monitoring your urine for protein, and checking a test in your blood called serum creatinine. When your kidneys fail, if detected early, you can be put on treatment that can slow down the progression of your kidney disease. Unfortunately, if you reach advanced kidney failure, the options are to undergo dialysis or transplantation. Transplantation is available in Kenya, we have a very good success rate. 
Kenya does about 150 transplants in a year. We have about six centers in Kenya that can do uh, kidney transplants. Dialysis should only be a stopgap measure as you're waiting for a transplant for most patients who can access a donor. Unfortunately, the challenge of donors is real and uh, Kenya is in the process of uh, passing a law to allow for deceased donation so that we can get organs from people who have died. Once this goes through, we would be able to improve our kidney transplants tremendously as we will now get enough donors uh, to donate for the kidney transplant. One thing that people need to realize is that once you've been transplanted, you need to take the medications for the rest of your life to avoid rejection. When you do get kidney rejection, there is some medications that can be used to try to treat your kidney so that you can go back to a normal life. Unfortunately, sometimes a kidney cannot be treated and you might need to go back on dialysis and wait for another transplant. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Felicita, for sharing your experience. We are so sorry for your loss, but we are also grateful for how many years has it been uh, for you? For me, 1990. Until now. Until now. More than uh, almost 34 years. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. And you're still healthy and strong. Oh, yes. So we are grateful for that and thank also you. for sharing your experience. Yeah. And also thank you so much, Dr. Tari, for handling these and many more cases. Actually, most people refer us to you. So it's a good job that you're doing. Yeah. Thank yes, you. for this facility as well. So perhaps where people can find you, maybe you can just tell them. Okay. Um, if you go to the way, if you Google Felicita Churi, you'll see everything. You'll see my two books, first, second, and uh, this one, editions. If you go to Luria, Luria Online Bookshop, you will get them and they deliver. You don't have to go, you, you don't have to go there. So you can get this and uh, you read. Especially this one is very good for patients, kidney patients, caregivers, uh, and everybody else who they have lost a child. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Ari, where can people come and find you? Okay, I'm based at the Parklands Kidney Center. This is uh, opposite Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi on 3rd Parklands Avenue. Uh, the building is called uh, PMC Building. We are on the fourth floor. We are open every day except uh, Sunday. Okay, thank you so much for gracing our show. And uh, for you, dear viewer, in case you have any question, 22151 is our SMS line. Also on our socials, at KTN Home underscore, at Ali underscore Zaitun. Uh, stay tuned until the next show. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.